and um, and the first thing uh, with any kind of uh, if you if you get the product development in general, the first question is uh, should you should you build or should you buy? Uh, uh, this is always the very recommendation what we what we what we are also saying to people like uh, you shouldn't invent the bicycle when there are already ones available. Uh, so uh, before you start right away going into uh, into bespoke solution development or uh, building your building the totally new brand new solution from scratch uh, check out existing products um, check out what's available in the market uh, if you if you want to like build a crm there are like plenty of crms already available so ask uh, so if you have like a process you want to automate uh, with IT uh, or digital products, uh, ask around what other companies are using already at first. Uh, then uh, secondly, check out uh, different product reviews uh, from blog posts, review sites, Quora, Google around, and uh, and always also check out Product Hunt, which is uh, which is the place where uh, all the new startups are putting their fancy fancy products. Uh, uh, but and then uh, then uh, when so if you have actually chosen to uh, to choose the, the product off the shelf then uh, this one has some good sides and bad sides just covering those very quickly uh, they are very logical basically of course buying an off-the-shelf product is smaller initial investment uh, quick setup you can start right away uh, Test it out. Usually, they have like 30 days free trials. Like majority of the cloud-based digital tools these days, digital products. Uh, then they usually have automatic updates, make it less, which make it less costly. Support and maintenance included, less costly. But of course, uh, the the downsides of that is that it's they are might not be dis designed and customized for your needs. Uh, uh, there is. Uh, the, you don't have so much control of data handling, for example. Uh, uh, there might be some compatibility issues, like say uh, you are on Mac, but there is no, uh, if we are talking about desktop applications, uh, you are on Mac, but there is no Mac client, there is only Windows client. And majority of the digital products these days are cloud-based though, but there might be some browser issues. Um, and you should also think about license fees that if you are tying tying up yourself with your with digital product that is uh, that is uh, one part of your core business uh, you might be tied along with a long time and of course it uh, inc has some fees so uh, uh, okay but the, the alternative is then building your own product what are the good sides and bad sides with that? Good side is that, of course, you can customize it really efficiently. Uh, so you can actually customize it exactly, build build the product exactly for your needs. You can control the system. You can right away have the possibility, which we anyway suggest to all our clients, even if you are building a bespoke solution for your own, uh, the point of IT scalability. Uh, you should right away even uh, we have consulted our clients like for example one um, uh, huge uh, production plant we built uh, mm, mm, built basically production uh, optimizing software uh, they they right away started thinking that okay let's build it for us in the beginning and then let's try to productize it make it a software as a service business out of it. that's like a uh, good side with uh, with if you open the product um it might give you some competitive advantages uh if your competition is like not so innovative not using the the most efficient digital tools then you might by having a digital product you might win the competition uh to say nothing about integrations which are easily doable with all your other it systems um, when you're building it for your own but of course the downside is uh, the development costs um, which are high um, but it should be done in a smart way which we tell afterwards in the how to in the in the best practices part 
And, uh, and of course, the downside is also time consuming. Uh, it takes a little bit of time until you actually get the product done so you can actually use it. So I have actually summarized those into a little table as well. Um, it's a very logical table, but just to very quickly go and going over it. Uh, so if you have like really general needs, uh, and of course, if you have a limited budget, then you should go for a off the shelf product. Uh, just do a little bit research, find out something. If your uh, needs are getting more complex, of course, you should think about, and of course it requires a little bit uh, uh, larger initial investment, you should think about uh, building your own, um, your own product. And there is of course this software as a service uh, uh, part, which, which like all the startups are actually like SaaS businesses at least, uh, uh, are uh, building their the product in order to make actually to to productize it and actually to sell it to other other companies as well other clients not only for themselves. Uh, so uh, now, if you have finally decided that okay, off the shelf product everybody knows, I have my more complex needs. I know what I want. I want to build uh, my own product. The first question comes to your mind is uh, whether you should outsource or hire your own product team. And we have listed, uh, I, have, I have similarly listed uh, the pros and cons of uh, hiring your own in-house product team as well as uh, hiring a product agency uh, here. And I'm going to talk them through and then I'm going to suggest exactly what should you or uh, based on our experience, how you should pick the best product partner in a way as well as pick the, the, the best IT team if you're hiring in-house. So at first pros and cons of hiring your own uh, in-house team. Uh, of course, communication is more efficient. The ones that have been in the product development, uh, they, they know that communication is important. Uh, product ownership is more efficient as the product owner is part of the, your core team. Um, this is, uh, makes it a little bit more efficient. And uh, of course, when the digital products, what you are building is copy key part of your whole overall business model. Let's say you are a startup. Of course, uh, then hiring your own in-house team is uh, anyway making sense. But uh, again, the downsides are costs because building an efficient product team, which means like product owners, professional product owners who have experience, product designers, product developers, it's it all it's very expensive keeping the good talent in house and, and so on. So this is uh, definitely, this is definitely um, something for long term. And uh, of course, not all the roles are needed after the project is complete, say product designers is our, uh, is a really good example when product design is usually needed in the in the early stages more at least uh, of course in the longer run as well but uh, but uh, when you when you have already the design framework done layouts views uh, done then sometimes like uh, sometimes uh, the, the resources are kind of like uh, not fully used and you can easily run out of cash when uh, when you have a lot of costs with your product uh, in-house team. Uh, as to outsourcing now, okay, pros is um, you can control the resource and costs, scale up, scale down resources. While, uh, you can do actually getting time to market is also a lot faster with our experience, uh, with our clients. Uh, if you have like a very concrete MVP in mind and you want to launch it fast, then um, then hiring an outsourcing outsource product team just makes it really much much faster. When you want to actually raise maybe money or or get to the next phase, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, and then of course more expertise. Uh, Product agencies, uh, professional product agencies that are have been building like hundreds of different products, they uh, they usually like can can get some experience, like kind of bring experience from one project to another. Um, so, uh, but of course, uh, bad sides or like the downsides uh, is um, a communication gap. Uh, 
which is like not a big downside because professional agencies uh, have already processes and tools to make the communication really efficient. We are using, for example, Basecamp, Slack, Google Meet. Um, even when this crisis started, like uh, we didn't have any communication issues with the clients because major like half of the clients are anyway, uh, like like majority of the clients are uh, are anyway uh, global for us. So um, uh, didn't affect at all. Uh, transparency and security is sometimes like an issue why people might think that oh outsource team is a little bit bad and and trust uh, I'm saying that trust is really important because if you're choosing an outsource partner then you are probably engaging in long term and uh, and that's why uh, take businesses that have uh, shown that they can continue uh, and and keep the trust of course we are uh, it's very typical is to sign anyway an nda in the very beginning all our like all the service contracts in professional product agencies anyway have like nda clauses so there are ways how to go or get over it uh, and uh, another thing what what might be thinking uh, that the knowledge uh, that the knowledge product knowledge goes outside the company uh, this is uh, usually avoided by professional product agencies with like really good documentation so the user stories uh, uh, like all the pro uh, user stories are actually written down uh, uh, documented uh, uh, code is documented well structured this like kind of as well like shows when the agency is already good enough then they they give you the actual the product ownership uh, like well over like they give the documentation over that helps to uh, continue the product development whenever with your in-house team and so on. And uh, we anyway make sure always that there is somebody in the client side that uh, that has the full product know-how. You're not like, uh, yeah, this, is, this should be actually the agency side as well to guarantee. Uh, so, uh, but that, uh, apart from um, buying the existing product and uh, and oh sorry apart from uh, hiring your in-house team as well as uh, or uh, hiring a product agency you have alternative options all the time you have freelancers plenty of them available uh, uh, upwork plenty of platforms where they are uh, offering their services from all the product development levels, product product analysis, project management, product design, software development. Okay, there are downsides with freelancers that they might um, disappear when something more interesting is coming up. Um, so yeah, but for each, uh, but so this is always an option. There is always a body lease option, uh, hiring some kind of, uh, like a team member, product team member from a software agency temporarily. Agencies are dealing with that as well, offering. Uh, and then, the, of course, there is hybrid approach that you are um, you are using like the, the, the resources, the only some parts of the product development. For example, you are helping, like you are taking a product agency or, or a product consultant to help you with product analysis. Uh, then, or with design, or with the coding or software development, or with the quality assurance. So, all uh, options are actually available. But now, uh, to the uh, to what our mind, like just based on our experience, um, uh, how and talking with our clients uh, and understanding um, how should you pick the best product team. Uh, as well as from both sides, uh, I have like slides for both sides. One is that how to hire an outsource team to choose to choose the best outsource team, as well as how to hire your talent into your house, and based on our experience. So, uh, uh, as to software uh, product agency. Uh, the first thing most important uh, before you go to the agency uh, is actually uh, product analysis. Uh, I always recommend to, um, this is actually a bigger problem in the whole world that uh, the product analysis process is not internationally standardized. 
like uh, uh, compared to, for example, building houses, building construction. Like, if you want to build like a twelve-story building today, um, you are uh, most probably like if and if you go to um, there are uh, like a lot of people here, not uh, all from Estonia, but basically if you go to a construction company, with like a ten. A4 sheets of paper, uh, which kind of describes the building you want, um, then probably construction company doesn't take you seriously because uh, there is already a standardized process for construction that there is an architect, like special uh, architecture bureaus that make the architecture. So there are international standards how you should define the, 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 the end result in a, in, a, in a documented way. Which is an architecture in a way. In in uh, in digital product development, unfortunately, because the whole world is moving really fast, and uh, the boom of digital products just like um, it hasn't had enough time. So uh, that's why there is no standards, and there are only best practices. And we even also have our own best practices how to analyze the products and uh, what should be the. We are talking about that uh, later on as well, but uh, but. Uh, but my point is that before you go to a product agency or if you are if you are choosing to hire a software agency uh, do do the do the product analyze first because then uh, then you you can like kind of go with a very concrete specification uh, based on what the product agencies can give you quotes and they are comparable then if you have like a very vague documentation and then uh, they, the the those quotes are not co comparable at all, uh, and um, yeah. So uh, my suggestion is uh, that uh, yeah, like uh, think it through. Uh, if no experience, outsource product analysis. Second one, uh, if you want to get like a fixed quote, what a lot of companies want to get uh, is uh, is to the product design. Secondly. I'm going to tell about best practice of product design afterwards, uh, like in general, why product uh, design is important, but later on. But, uh, but, uh, but basically, if you have already a design made, then the, uh, for developers, especially for front end, if you have a lot of UI user interface uh, in the product, uh, it's just like so much easier uh, to give uh, co accurate quotes. So, uh, so also try to design the product. Uh, if you don't have again uh, uh, experience in product design uh, or product designers on board, then outsource it. And then the third one is uh, understand some tech as well, um, because and otherwise you will be cheated in the market because uh, there are a lot of. Uh, from my experience, the, the quality of, like, especially in London, for example, what the hell? There are like the competition is so high. There are so many, uh, uh, so many different uh, agencies and software development, and freelancers, agencies everywhere, and they are. Uh, if you don't know tech, they might just like, um, uh, they might just like, yeah, uh, cheat you. Uh, so. I totally recommend to uh, to use some again outsourced consultant or someone who is uh, evaluating that whether the 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 skills and level and experience of understanding not just like one programming language but also com concrete frameworks in software development say like whether uh, are those guys actually Angular specialists when they are claiming or they are just like general like the, there are a lot of or in our case we are like Python Django agency and React doing front end then uh, are how good are they in uh, in other frameworks and not only Python you know so just uh, understand some tech and finally when when you have like a better understanding you you, you will probably find a better product uh, agency fit as well so then you go and look for a matching tech stack if you if you have like a tech stack um, clear uh, choose always a good people fit and uh, experience and always ask referrals recommendations uh, majority of our business is actually coming through referrals <laughs> Uh, even today, uh, it's like uh, 
uh, yeah, you get some good experience and then people uh, suggest you on. And then I always start when you're picking some a company, start small, test, uh, test the fit, start with an MVP. And this goes, it's actually a general uh, suggestion to the whole agile software, the agile product development. Don't build the whole monstrum, but start with an MVP and then you have more information and start build on and on. So, um, I think we don't have any questions. I thought that maybe I'm answering some questions, but apparently none at the moment. <laughs> but okay, uh, we have a time for questions in the afterwards. And then as to the, okay, then I'll, next alternative is you're hiring your own internal team. Um, always an option and here i'm just like very general uh, uh, there there should there could be a separate lecture on top of how to hire the best talent and so on but just like very simple uh, points here higher attitude culture fit this is what what we do we hire attitudes we hire culture fit we always ask referrals um, we have our own tests for uh, testing the 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 developers, for example, uh, check code always um, in repos, the code quality, uh, the architectural thinking. Uh, and of course, the most important is uh, company culture and company fit. And uh, you, you need to build when you are building a good team these days, you need to have a good company culture. Uh, I think all the startups should, uh, should agree with that. So, uh but uh this is this is all what i wanted to say about uh about how to choose the the, the right partners and how to choose uh, people and um, now just based on target experience some some tips what we have just noticed that uh, even today uh uh, startups are not definitely uh, are, are a little bit better than that bigger companies are probably facing some challenges there so basically some points i wanted to just stress out about um, when you are actually building a bespoke solution or a digital product um, from scratch uh, so uh, first thing is uh, what i what i already stressed i want to stress it again uh, is that product analysis is the most important part of the product development. Uh, it's just like an architecture of the house is the most important when you are when you want to build a house. Uh, and if you do, if you get it right and if you do it like properly, it's just like your design and development just is just so much ch uh, cheaper. And uh, as I mentioned as well, there are no very good international standards. We have also checked what other agencies are doing and like kind of like. It's probably the like modern product agents are more or less approaching it the same way, but maybe using a little bit different terms. But uh, but we have like a MVP workshop made for that where we define an MVP, uh, and uh, and basically in this workshop, it's usually two, one, two, three days depending on the size of the product. Uh, we set the goal uh, of the, the MVP. What what hypothesis do we have to test? Uh, we, we set the concept terms that everybody is like, if we are writing user stories, then everybody is talking about the same terms, concepts, users, of course, define the exact users, define the exact user flows. And in addition to the user flows, I want to stress also user stories, which we have finally understood that it makes sense to write those user stories very detailed already in the very beginning especially where, like of course in our case we we often start with product analyze then with your product design and then with your product development so uh, uh, we write already user stories already in the analysis phase because they could be they are an input for designers to give really really uh, quite accurate uh, um, quote or a, a internal like kind of estimate and then also for developers to give better estimates. And those the same user stories will be used afterwards in the, you, you can just copy paste them into Jira or, uh, or whichever IT product project management tool you are using to run your sprints. Uh, and then uh, we, we uh, sometimes we do also mockups, depends on the, how complex the UI and some views are. 
Um, sometimes we during the product analysis we go already into very uh, tech related uh, stuff. I don't know. It's it's like uh, models, uh, database models, database architecture. Maybe there are some API endpoints which we need to already in the very beginning agree on, uh, which give again like a better better um, mm, estimates internally. Uh, and then uh, then of course. Uh, then we understand like which features should be for next uh, phases and what will be the release plan. So, and then uh, the second point. So the first is analyze is super important. Second one is design is also super important, <laughs> uh, which means that the design the product before development. Uh, we we have even internally like a system that we don't give out. Uh, fixed development quotes and unless uh, especially when there is ui involved uh, unless there is a uh, full product design done uh, and uh, yeah and designing a product through makes you helps you also to uh, to test the product on real users before actually going into development and so on so design the product through uh, so actually this slide is about uh, Torgate typical product development li service line in a way. We do analyze, we do design, we do development, and then we provide the support and maintenance for all our existing products. Uh, and the third point uh, I wanted to brought out is the, those user stories. It's just a very example, uh, like just an example from our MVP scope document, or like the user story, which is like very detailed, uh, detail already written out already in the product analysis phase. Uh, which, as you can see, there is some kind of uh, uh, user called seller representative, and then there is a user called seller administrator, and then there is a uh, there is a term called buyer there, and uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, it just like describes the 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 user story for developers as well are really detailed and actually we have understood that for designers such kind of input is also much much clearer because i don't know uh, those who have been in the product development process uh, the designers are very creative people uh, we are quite often even it depends on the product though but we're quite often leaving them out from the product analysis uh, because uh, they might just like go on with like a really wild ideas unless the product is really design oriented uh, uh but but the aim of the the product analysis is to uh to uh exactly to understand user story and to, th there is more uh, analytical uh mind needed there i hope i express myself uh, uh clearly so uh these are the these are actually everything what i wanted to tell about my side and now uh, i'll give the word over to uh, orkan who is telling about uh, about uh, best practices for uh, guaranteeing the efficiency in software development? All right. Thank you, Yonar. Hi again, everyone who joined us uh, a bit later as well. So basically, as Yonar mentioned, I will talk about the giving right estimations and how to measure development teams' efficiency. Uh, but before I start, it should also be noted that the factors and points that I'm going to mention can be adjusted and extended based on your development team and on your uh, product that you are developing. So the, basically the purpose is to give you the understanding so later on you can grasp the idea and uh, apply it accordingly based on your needs. Uh, keep in mind that uh, I want to mention the one of the most significant factors that will make your life easier while giving the estimation is the product owner's experience with a similar feature or product that you're going to develop. So uh, imagine that uh, you have a new client and he wants you to uh, develop a new dashboard for his product. And if you have similar product to similar features developed previously, it can make your life easier to give the right estimation. Especially if you're going to use the same tech stack, it could be even like, uh, uh, correct and precise uh, in doing that. And the next point will be the nature of the project. So whether it's stable or unstable. And when we say stable, uh, we mean the fact that how much information we know about the uh, project itself, do we well aware about the scope, do we know uh, how stable the industry itself or not. And based on that, 
your next steps will be quite straightforward. And on the other hand, if the project itself is not stable, if, if the industry isn't stable, if you know less information about the uh, uh, project itself and the, the scope and the development of the project seems a bit uh, not clear to you, then the estimation uh, can be a little bit uh, uh, difficult to make and then you will have to uh, raise your estimation, which we will discuss in the next slides. But the next important point is that your product owners knowledge the tech knowledge and the collaboration with your development team uh, because it's also important for a product owner to know uh, what's the potential of your development team when uh, you will receive a new feature that will need to be implemented the product owner needs to know the load of your development team and how much senior uh, or medium medium level developers do you have and how much time will it take to deliver certain features that's why the communication and knowing the potential of development team for product owner is, uh, is really important. It will, give, it will make it possible for him or for her to give the quick and uh, accurate estimation for the client. And last but not least is product owner's experience in a certain industry. And even at Torgate, when we deal with multiple clients, when we deal with multiple industries, we try to pick uh, product owners who already has certain experience with the uh, specific industry that he or she is going to deal with. And this is like the common vectors and regarding the questions, when you receive a new feature from the client, from your customer that needs to be implemented, there are certain questions that you have to uh, go through before giving the estimate. And one of them will be the, is your client, does your client really need uh, the certain feature to be implemented? because uh, one of the essential uh, jobs or responsibilities for the product owner will be not always implement what uh, client or customer comes to you and says that, let's say we want to implement this one, but rather product owner should be able to stop the client and make him think twice that is he or she really need that feature to be implemented. In that way, first your client uh, next time and during uh, will think about the features that really needs to be implemented and it also it will increase the trust uh, in you uh, that uh, the client will understand and you really do care about the product and you really want to include those features which are really significant for the customer and often there can be cases in which the client may come up with a feature but the feature may serve as an mvp so let's say your client wants to introduce a new feature but he wants it to be not uh, fully developed, but rather something that he, uh, their customers, their clients uh, can try on. And that can be served as the initial, let's say, step for the big feature. In that case, your estimations and your, uh, let's say, timing uh, constraints will vary. You will think that, okay, if it's an MVP, I will have to deliver it in a short amount of time. We may skip certain uh, quality aspects because it needs to be a basically workable solution. Uh, not as stable as the fully uh, functional, uh, let's say, feature. And yeah, and let's say that uh, if your client comes up with a feature and if he really needs that, and with which option you want to uh, carry on, you also have to have in mind like multiple options for the same feature. Uh, let's um, uh, give you like very basic example. Imagine that your client, uh, you have a tabular view and your client wants that view to be ex exported to an external file, to a new file. So basically, he clicks a button and the tabular view is exported to a new file. And then you may have two options here. Whether you want it to be exported, let's say, for example, for a PDF file, or you want it to be exported for, to an Excel file. When you take into account these uh, considerations, you also have to think about the uh, point in which uh, how uh, likely your client may change his um, decision. Even at Torgate, we had the cases in which we developed, we went with option one and we presented, we released that option one and then clients said, okay, it, it could, it's good, all is all right, all is well, but uh, now I want the option two to be implemented for the same feature. And since uh, often we had that uh, consideration in mind, for, uh, for us it, it becomes easier to switch from one option and to deliver it with the next option that client, uh, let's say, uh, needs. And yeah, the next important point is that, that of course, uh, the how certain feature will be designed and implemented. As mentioned in previous slides, through which user stories, uh, well-defined user stories, the 
whole feature will be uh, will go through. And yep. And the last point regarding the question will be how critical is the new feature? Because often the client uh, may introduce one feature, which is like uh, one feature. It will go to live. It will be really crucial for the client. And therefore, when delivering and re when releasing that feature, you have to be this feature has to be throughout the tested because the main functionality will depend on that feature. But on the other hand, there might be cases in which you want to develop something big, but you want to start from the smaller parts, from the smaller uh, bits of the whole big feature. And then you may uh, deliver the first feature and the, all the bugs, all the corrections, all the amendments can be done in the next phase of your delivery. So these are the uh, moments that needs to be taken into account when you evaluate and you assess uh, the estimates that you give to your client. And in the next slide, uh, we can see the uh, two graphs. Uh, these specific graphs will be suitable for stable project. In stable project, as I mentioned previously, you uh, know the scope of the feature or product that you're going to develop. And all the steps seems clear for you. And therefore, moving from one step to another will be pretty straightforward. And in this case, you can see that at initiation stage and between the initiation stage and between the completion or execution stage, there is a difference of 75%, which means that if you come up with a decision that your final product, uh, complete product, will cost, uh, let's say, $100,000, then it's totally fine uh, to... Uh, give an estimate to a client of uh, 175,000 and between 75,000 and 175,000. And, uh, and for planning stages, the uh, according cost will be 130,000 and uh, for execution, 110. This, this is the case when uh, the project is stable. But if we look at the another study regarding uh, which suits more to unstable project, we can see that the difference goes up to 300%. And as you can see, the steps are more compared with the previous stable project. Why? Because when you move from one step to another, you uh, grasp the understanding and scope of the project little by little. That's why you cannot uh, make a big jump, but rather you will go slowly and therefore, the execution time uh, can take a certain amount of time, and then the difference will be uh, considerably bigger. For example, if your total execution, if you have the estimation of 100,000, then the estimation that you give to the client can go up to 300,000, and then so on. And, and the next slide, we how we do it in the, at Torgate. Now, how this uh, process goes uh, from beginning to an end, implementing feature from the start to an end. Uh, first step, uh, product owner speaks to the client with the customer, taking into account the features and factors and questions that uh, were mentioned previously. After that, uh, product owner defines using uh, creating user stories and uh, aspects uh, such as like definitions of time, creates initial estimation which is later uh, serves as an input for our sprint planning. During sprint planning, uh, we give, we get the product owner gets the input from the developers, tech leads, and uh, we finalize the estimation. If the difference between the initial estimation and the actual estimation is uh, quite big, considerably big, then product owner can go back to the client, explain the reasoning why the initial estimation uh, got bigger. And after the task, after the feature is implemented, it goes through the re-evaluation stage in which we check uh, what was the actual completion time for the feature, for the task. And we also keep track of two, uh, let's say, uh, important points. Like one of them is a greater value in which we uh, uh, check, have we used like uh, our, based on our previous experience, have we used our architectural and design consideration of frameworks, particularly for this task, and have we fixed any other aspects of the product as well? Because often there can be a case in which you want to deliver a new feature, but at the same time, this new feature requires other aspects, other parts of the product uh, being refactored or being improved as well. If you invest your time into that parts of the uh, product, in you know, different uh, parts of the product, then 
we also take into we, we also take this into account which is at the end uh, when we finally build a client uh, which is always uh, taken into account and yep that was like the uh, brief summary of the uh, how we do the estimation and how we see the estimation uh, needs to be done and next uh, moving on to the development team's efficiency uh, we divide it into three steps three categories one is uh, being like spring related we track how many points and how many tasks were completed during per sprint and uh, we track uh, the aspects related to a certain developer like how many points were completed by a developer per week and how many points uh, were completed by a developer uh, involved in internal procedures uh, or products and uh, it's quite um, common for most of the digital companies, tech companies, that they work on their internal product, internal uh, procedures, and how much time and how much effort they do invest into that. Uh, we keep track uh, of that as well. And as we encourage people, as we encourage developers to uh, reuse the common architectural or uh, design decisions that we gather from our previous experiences, from our previous clients we also track this uh, uh, aspect like this value using this greater value uh, like point as well and obviously if we talk about the measurement and if development teams uh, involved uh, with the product development and project development we also uh, track project related aspects as well so in our case they are quality index in which we track uh, the uh, when we release a certain feature, when it goes live, we track how many bugs, how many corrections, and how many amendments came back afterwards. So this will define our quality index. If all went so well and we don't have any bugs, any correction, then we will consider that the quality index is 100%. And the project satisfaction index, which is also important, in which we uh, pay attention to the factors such as how easy it is to onboard a new developer to a new project, uh, which means that how complex is the project uh, logic itself and also how easy to work on the project as well because uh, when you develop a product you may not always start from the scratch you may acquire some uh, uh, product some legacy code and working on that uh, may not always be uh, pleasant let's say and these are the main aspects that we tracked and uh, regarding this quality and project satisfaction index uh, we can see like two graphs on the left hand side you will see project satisfaction index let's look at the four projects uh, for example green project will have a 70 percent of uh, satisfaction index rate 80 yellow 60 and the blue one will have 90 percent of satisfaction index we often see that uh, satisfaction index and the quality index are directly related which means that if the satisfaction index is higher most likely that the project quality index will be higher as well but, uh, of course, there might be exceptions as well. If you look at the red line on the right-hand side, which is for the uh, red project, as you can see, although the uh, project satisfaction index is 80%, at some point it can go down, and there can be uh, various reasons for that. There can be a reason, for example, a developer uh, involved in, developers involved in that particular product or particular project uh, can be changed or product owner for the product can change as well, which will uh, have an effect on the quality index as well, which uh, needs to be taken into account. And yeah, and finally, as I mentioned, we uh, track uh, the uh, sprint progress as well, uh, in which we use uh, sprint burn down chat. Basically, at the beginning of the sprint, we have the certain amount of points that needs to be completed. Uh, for example, in this graph on your screen, you can see that it's 40. And throughout the end of the uh, sprint, these points should go to the uh, zero, which means that you start with 40 points and then you burn them all until the zero. And the gray line, the guideline, the number uh, three that you see in your, on your screen is the guideline. This is the ideal line, which means that you start from 40 and uh, finish at the zero. The red line is your current progress. Uh, which means uh, if it's above the ideal line, which means you're not meeting the uh, your target, your goal, and if it's above, 
it, it means that you were able to give a really good estimate and you're uh, working towards meeting meeting the uh, your sprint goal we also use this chart i want uh, to mention it as well that we also use this chart when we deliver like big feature imagine that we have a big feature a big product feature that we want to deliver throughout multiple weeks we we may apply the uh, exactly the same burn out burn down chart to see how we are uh, meeting our estimates so what tasks were completed and uh, what's the our progress uh, regarding the feature that is being implemented and regarding the periods that we measure uh, the efficiency for in our case it's monthly so monthly we do collect uh, and present the new reports uh, the efficiency but of course depending on the size of the team it can be weekly or if it's like a big uh, team big company it can be quarterly as well yeah and that's pretty much uh, the uh, point regarding estimation and uh, measuring uh, development team's efficiency. Yeah. If you have any questions, please. Uh, chat. Yes, I think this is this was um, everything what we wanted to cover during this webinar. So. Um, yeah, now it's questions and answers time. And I already got one question from uh, Robert. Uh, so we asked about uh, what should be the minimum risk management effort in your opinion when outsourcing product development? Is NDA enough? And uh, would be would uh, risk management ISOs like ISO certificates needed or common? Uh, some kind of confirmation of acknowledgement of risk in some specific projects. So. Uh, in our experience, yes, like for example, just from the from our uh, how we work. So in the service contract, there is already a uh, clause for uh, non-disclosure, and this is what you should always keep in mind when you are signing a contract with an outsource uh, party. That in the service contract, there should be a, a, a clause like non-disclosure clause in addition yes quite often uh, we sign a separate nda uh, this is uh, quite often required for us we have like a very simple system just uh, 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 yeah that we are using uh, docusign for just and it automatically goes out every time when someone wants uh, our nda it's just like easy busy so this is very common as to the ISO certificates, uh, risks, are, uh, by the way, we have noticed those, like for example, I remember when we talked with BMW, uh, they had like a lot of huge uh, risk uh, procedures in place. So, uh, and uh, they wanted, but at the end, we don't have a, a ISO certificate for some uh, risk certificate, just being very uh, transparent here. But, uh, but uh, finally, even they didn't require it. Uh, so we got through actually the, the process without even needing it. So as to ESO certificates, they are not so much needed from our practice. I hope I answered your question. <laughs>